All right, so we still have our grid layout here with two rows and three columns. I just got rid of the unused code on top here to clean this up a bit. And now let's go ahead and see how we can actually change the arrangement of the grid items in the grid container. So I'm going to refer to, let's say, the um, and child, and in this case, the second child. And now I want to say that this item two here should actually be, let's say, in the position where item one currently is, so in the top left cell. Now what I can do is I can say grid row start, and I'm gonna say one, and then grid row end is gonna be two. Now what's important to notice here is that I start with one, and this actually refers to this first horizontal or row grid line here. So we're not starting the indexing by zero, as maybe some of you who have some experience in programming languages might be tempted to do. So this is the first grid line here on the horizontal level. So this is where this should start. And then grid row N2 is going to be this grid line down here. So the second horizontal grid line. So it's always important to keep in mind that when you have two rows, like we do here, you always have actually three lines that you can work with because you always need the first line and you always need the line at the end here. So if you have two rows, you have three grid lines. And of course, with the three columns, you have four grid lines that separate each of the columns. So grid row start one and end two means basically that grid item two should just be in the first row like it already is. So that's not actually gonna change anything, but I just wanted to show you the properties and then grid column start, of course, and grid column end can be used to do the same thing for columns. So again, we're gonna say one, two, and this is now gonna change something because grid column start one is here and grid column end is here, which is the what the two stands for. So now item two is gonna be in this place. If I wanted to move item two here to the second row, I could just go ahead and change the start to two and the end to three, meaning that this should be between two here, which is this grid line, and three, which is this one. So this is how you can define where each item should be. But of course, this is a bit lengthy, so I'm gonna show you a shorthand, and let's say we're gonna target the fifth child, so item five, and then you can just say grid row. And again, we're gonna use a slash to separate the two values so I'm gonna say this should actually go into the first row now. So one, two, this refers now to grid row start is one and grid row end is two. And similarly, let's say grid column. Well, let's say the first column, so it should be in the very top left position on the grid. And there it is, item five here in the first cell in our grid. Now, of course, these two are fixed and then the rest is just gonna be inserted like normally. So it's just gonna go ahead here, the grid container, and arrange the rest in the order as it is in the HTML markup. So these four cells are still free, and it's just gonna put them in there like normally. Now later we're gonna see another shorthand where you can actually set all these values at the same time. And we're also gonna take a look at the more readable syntax than this one. But for now I wanna show you that you can also say that, for example, item five here should actually span two columns. So let's actually say the end should be at column three or line three. And then that way, it's just gonna span all the space of these two cells. And what the grid is gonna do with the last item is just like in the very first lecture or the first grid that we created, it's just gonna go on and create a new implicit row in the grid where it can put this item. So even though we have only defined two rows here, it's actually not gonna just, well, get rid of this item here, but it's gonna create a new row. And this is actually called the implicit grid. And we're gonna talk about this, of course, in more detail later. So that's something you can do. You can also, if I go to item two here again, I could say that the grid row N should actually be four, which is by itself outside of the defined grid. And it's just gonna use this implicit row here and span all these two cells. And then of course, item six is gonna be pushed even further down 
into this new grid cell here. Now you can see that this implicit row here is still going to use the column definition. So item six here, this cell still has the same width as every cell in this column, of course, otherwise it would just be a bad layout system and it wouldn't be consistent. All right, so that way you can basically spend arbitrary cells in your grid. But of course, this has got to form a grid area. So remember that a grid area is surrounded by four grid lines. So what you cannot do at the moment is, let's say, spend the space that item two currently has plus the space that item three currently has, because that's a strange well shape for a element on the page. But the working group on the grid layout team isn't actually saying that this will never be possible. So who knows, maybe sometime in the future, you can actually create shapes like this for elements on a web page. But for now, if you wanted to span the space of item three here with item two, you would also have to span the space down here where item six currently is. So that way you would still have the four grid lines here around your item. All right, so this is already becoming more powerful. You can now not only define a grid very easily with the rows and columns, you can also arrange all the items pretty much arbitrarily and also very, very easily and fast. So you can already imagine that it's a nice way to sketch or prototype web layouts. But we're gonna talk about many more things you can do, so let's go ahead and move on to the next lecture.